So, if you are ready, I wish to introduce this uh, press conference about the British colonial land and human rights abuses in Kenya, uh, UN complaint for justice and compensation. And I wish to thank the organizer for, of this uh, press meeting and the participants, speakers, uh, Professor Paul Shepkoni, who will, uh, he, who is the governor of the, this region, Mr. Uh, Kimutai Bosek, a Kenyan lawyer, and uh, Mr. Rodney Dixon, coming from, uh, uh, from London, from Great Britain, uh, also to speak about this important topic. Uh, so thanks again. Welcome to Geneva and to the Press Club. Before to give you the floor, I will I wish to ask you to sign our golden book, uh, just a signature there, Amen. as we do. Uh, yeah. signature? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All the, yeah, the speakers are asked to sign our book. Yeah. And uh, we will start with the, the presentations. Yeah. So thanks, and uh, you will uh, introduce. You. So have a good uh, press conference. Hello. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. Perfect. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you so much for having us here today at the Geneva Press Club, um, and thank you all for uh, joining us from uh, quite varied places <laughs> around Europe uh, and obviously to our um, speakers who have come today. Um, it's a really uh, great and important day today. Uh, it's bringing us one step, one small step closer uh, to achieving justice for the many thousands of uh, victims of British colonial rule in Kenya. Um, of course, we cannot <laughs> advocate for every single one of them. Um, uh, but many of them are still alive today. Uh, something that many people forget is that colonialism in Kenya only ended in 1963, which is really only 57 years ago. And, and that's, you know, a lot of the victims and the scars still remain to this very day. Uh, so thank you very much for coming to, along to this important event. Um, speaking today, we have the governor of Caricho County, His Excellency Professor Paul Chepkwani. Um, Caricho is the county in Kenya about which today's complaint, which we have filed um, at the UN, uh, is about. Uh, Caricho, uh, as many of you know who are Kenyans, um, is a very rich, uh, arable um, part of the country. A lot of tea is grown there. In fact, um, the majority of the tea is grown there. Caricho is famous for that. Uh, and so the governor is here today to represent his people um, and to tell some of their stories and, and how we got here today. Uh, we also have speaking um, today Kenyan advocate lawyer uh, Kimutai Bosek. Um, Mr. Bosek has been working tirelessly um, going through, you know, everything from the colonial archives uh, to gather all the evidence, the historical evidence of the abuses, um, as well as with his team on the ground in Kenya, uh, interviewing um, the now 115, th roughly 115,000 uh, victims that we have signed up to this complaint. Um, and then finally, we have uh, Mr. Rodney Dixon, who is a Queen's Council lawyer uh, from London, from Temple Garden Chambers. 
Um, uh, Mr. Dixon is uh, a very prominent human rights lawyer. Uh, he's acted in cases all over the world. Um, and he will be speaking to us today about the international uh, legal um, uh, means that we have to try and resolve uh, this historical injustice um, and, you know, try and make it a, a small bit better. Uh, so thank you all today. Oh, uh, finally, at the end, we're also going to have a short video, um, which is uh, an interview with a um, victim from uh, the Caricho region. Uh, and, it, and he is just going to describe, you know, some of the injustices and horrific human rights abuses that he faced uh, during British colonial rule. Um, so thank you very much for coming here today. We'll have time for questions at the end if you have any. Um, and with that, I will hand over to our speakers um, with the governor starting first. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As you've heard, I'm the governor of Kericho. My name is Professor Paul Kiprono Chipkwon, and I'm here on behalf of the county government of Kericho, as well as on behalf of the Kipsigis and the Talai, who have voted for me uh, two times now as their governor. I'm also a victim, being a descendant of the victims of British <coughs> atrocities against the Talai and the Kipsigis of Kericho. I would like to say that um, this particular move that has been made today where we've submitted uh, complaints uh, at the UN uh, Human Rights Council uh, on behalf of the Kipsigis and the Talai is a very, very important move. These people have suffered for a long time, more than 100 years. They've been crying for justice. It's never come. And we hope that this time something will happen. In collecting views from the people and as a victim and also having seen my parents and grandparents go through sufferings, I can confirm that um, the British came to Kericho and took land by force. They never bought it. And they still own that land to date. And I want to confirm that uh, the multinational companies in Kericho are making a lot of money. They are earning a lot of profits. All that profit is extradited to the United Kingdom, and nothing is remaining with the locals. There is a lot of poverty uh, among the Kipsigis and the Talai. Number two, in taking over the land by force, they burnt houses, which is first and foremost against the African culture and the local culture. They took away animals by force. So many cattle were, were taken by force. They destroyed sacred areas, including uh, areas where uh, passage of rights for the, the children uh, were held. They destroyed monuments. And the men who resisted this forceful uh, acquisition of land were lined up. Uh, in, in fact, 1905 in Sotik, out of 8,000 young men who resisted, 100 1,900 1, were lined up and massacred with gunshots, and these are issues that must be addressed. Kericho is one of the leading economies, uh, is the leading contributor to Kenyan economy, but the people are suffering because of this particular historical injustice. So we are here to tell the world that first of all at independence, the land in which the multinational companies are sitting should not have continued being the crown land. Yet, this never happened. At independence, part of Kenya became independent. Kericho did not become independent. So we are here to tell the world that the victims are suffering. What they demand is apology from the British government and reparation, compensation so that they may be better than they are today and catch up with the rest of the communities that did not suffer as much atrocities as the locals. Finally, 
we are determined to go all the way. Uh, we will leave no stone unturned until there is justice for the people. And particularly, there are communities within and families within the Kipsikis and the Lai who were forcefully delocalized, taken to far places. This is against human rights, where we have relatives being put together so that they may not get married and expand the population of their communities. There are particular communities of the Kipsikis who are forced to disown their culture and become Samburus. This is something that is against international law. And these are some of the things which we are asking the court to investigate and take very serious action against the British government so that there may be no recurrence again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. As you have heard, my name is uh, Joel Kimutai Bosek, and I uh, was tasked together with my team to anal collect and anal analyze all matters related to the historical injustices that were suffered by the Kipsigis and the Talai communities of Kericho, uh, what was formerly Kericho district, which now become, became Kericho County and Bomet County. And um, when I embark on this research, obviously I had some background knowledge about uh, the issues affecting the people. I come from that community and I heard from my grandparents how they suffered during the so-called the Kimulot model. And it used to be just but a story. But when I was given uh, the mandate and I uh, commissioned a number of researchers to conduct research in leading libraries within East Africa and also in Entebbe archive, because Entebbe used to be the headquarters of the East African Protectorate. We went all the way to the Kew Gardens National Archives in London, went to Oxford University Library and a few other libraries in the UK. And the story is the same. We interviewed more than 300 victims. And the story is the same, that the land belonged to them and that that land was taken away from them forcefully. And reading or on, on the materials from the archives, we were able to confirm and collaborate what the victims were saying. For instance, in 1905, 90,000 hectares of land was taken away from them in a place called Londiani, which is within Kiricho County. There was no compensation. The British decided to remove the native population, force them into the so-called native reserves of Bureti, Sotik, and Belgut. When you look at the story of these reserves, ladies and gentlemen, as an historian, I believe that the Bantustans in South Africa during apartheid, started by Dr. Malan in 1948, appears to have borrowed from the so-called native reserves in Kenya. It appears that, it appears that uh, the apartheid regime borrowed heavily from the British. They were learning from the best. Apartheid could have been created in 1948, but the native reserves in Kenya came into being in 1907. It means that uh, apartheid came in 40 years later. So actually, that was a form of apartheid, and nobody in the world appears to have uh, drawn a parallel or to relate the so-called native reserves in Kenya and the apartheid regime in South Africa, the Bantustans. Secondly, land was taken away throughout 1907 all the way to 1919, after the, sec the First World War. And by the way, many of our grandfathers fought in that war, and they don't even know that it was called the First World War. They will tell you 
that it was war against the Germans. They called the First World War the war against the Germans because the target was to kill the German in Tanganyika at that time. And they speak so much about it. Obviously, most of them are very old now, and others have uh, unfortunately passed on. And then for the Second World War, they say it is the war against the Italians. So when you hear them talk about the war against the Italians, they actually mean the Second World War. 5,000 Kipsigis men were taken to fight in Burma, including my, uh, a brother to my grandfather, uh, the late uh, Kipkones Arabosek, I've adapted his name, and uh, they fought for the British uh, government alongside the British, uh, other British troops. And when they came back to Kenya, the British saw the need of taking land away from them even after serving them so faithfully. But in 1919, let me start with 1919, the British uh, had soldiers who had gotten injured during the war. But to reward them and to make them have some form of uh, occupation, they decided that they should give them 25,000 acres of land in Kericho. Very fertile land, very arable land. And then this is land which the British government misled the world into thinking that it was first unoccupied and waste land. When they say land that is unoccupied, in other words, it does not have people, and waste land, if you go to Kericho and see that land, if where the multinational tea companies is a waste land, then the rest of the world is really a waste land. And we are telling the British that we have gone into your archives we are going into your writings. I mean, there was this idea that uh, if you want to keep something uh, hidden from a black man, put it in a book. And I'm very happy that uh, they wrote it uh, not knowing that uh, there will be a group of uh, people seated today who will be discussing whatever they did. Kericho uh, land that is under the multinationals is one of the richest, the most fertile, and the most arable land, not only in Kenya, but I believe actually in the world. And for them to call it unoccupied and wasteland, first of all, it was occupied. If I'm to name the 38 tea estates in Kiricho, all of them bear the local names. You'll hear names like Chagaik, Cheimen, Tagabi, all the way there are 38. None of them has the English name. If it was a wasteland, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps they could have called it uh, Sainsbury, Newbury, Slough, and uh, rivers there they could have been the small river Thames, like the Tare River probably. So we refuse to believe and to live under this kind of deceit. We have and we have had to bring very fraudulent nature of transaction that we had done. People being given land. In 1963, when they were leaving Kenya, the British settlers, white settlers, who included some uh, South Africans, those who never wanted to live in Kenya under a black leader, Jomo Kenyatta, were actually enticed by what many historians fail to appreciate, and let me say today and correct the record, that the British never paid the 100 million uh, pounds that they claim. That was not money that was meant for compensation. That amount of money was meant to be a fund so that whoever was not willing, uh, whichever, whichever sort of settler who was not willing to live in Kenya will actually uh, probably get some native Africans to buy that land because Africans were struggling and uh, this was a fund to allow the Africans to buy land from the settlers. And our historians have also failed us. In 1963 when we got independence, there was a mass migration of white settlers from Kenya to Zimbabwe. Nobody is able to link that move. The reason why Mugabe maybe died a crazy man is because of probably what he went through. In 1963, Zimbabwe had lost like 18, 18 million uh, uh, acres of land to the white settlers. But after 1980, uh, uh, when they got independence, the figure went up to 33 million. 
And most of these people who went to take up these uh, 13 million acres or so are the ones who are leaving Kenya and migrating to Zimbabwe. And then in Zimbabwe, when they got independence again in 1980, a number of them left to South Africa. South Africa became a multiracial democracy in 1994. There was also some kind of migration to places like uh, Australia. We are not hearing people being able to mention that. But that is for another day. I want to say this, that the British saw it fit to take land for free when there was actually a law which was transported from, uh, adapted from India, the Compulsory Acquisition of Lands Act of 19, 1894. That was not applied in Kenya. That was not applied when it came to the Kipsigis. When the Kipsigis land was taken for the railway construction, the railway land was supposed to be one mile apart. But for the Kipsigis and the Nandis, they were actually to move like 26 kilometers away, unlike other communities in Kenya. They were not allowed to be anywhere near the railway. A lot of things were done. And I want to uh, invite anybody to go to Kericho or even to come to us. We show you artifacts which we got from 51 sites within the TA states. We were pretending that uh, we were part of the people who were, who were working for the tea companies, but then collecting broken pots, broken calabashes. Obviously, those don't belong to Europeans. They belong to Africans. Then there are places where you will not find tea growing. Now, those were homesteads where uh, goats were kept, because I'm told uh, tea does not grow in places that are is it acidic or alkaline? Alkaline. And the dung from God's are alkaline. Um, the British, we must applaud the American missionaries. For us to have gone to school is because of the American missionaries. I know other communities in Kenya went to school courtesy of the British. But for us, the British did not even want us to go to school. As a matter of fact, the American missionaries uh, saw it fit to build hospitals like Tenwek. But when the British chased away the Talai, they could not even access uh, the mission hospitals, which they never built, but which were constructed by the uh, American missionaries. There was the so-called uh, Highlands Bible College, which was supposed to be constructed in Chagaik. But the land control board, which was mainly dominated by the British, were up in arms against the American missionaries telling them go and construct that university, useless university, in the African reserves. In Kericho, Anglican Church uh, only was started the other day. Not by the British, because I realized that you cannot be preaching to somebody and stealing from him. Remember, the British and the Americans were both on a mission, but to do two different uh, activities. The British settler was a on a mission to take away land. The American missionary was on a mission to convert Africans and to probably improve his lifestyle. Uh, when I listen to songs by Lucky Dube, I think it appears that uh, probably he was discussing about Kericho because the condition Lucky Dube was talking about, when he says born to server, when he says they are no longer building schools, all their buildings, uh, all what they are building is prisons, prisons. In Kericho, the British are not known to have left any significant structure for the African people, unlike the American missionaries. We have the Kericho prison, which was built by the British in 1942. Was the prison useful to the African people? We have so many detention camps that the British built. People who were detained, People who were imprisoned, be they from Kisi, from Lua, from Luyaland, all of them will be brought to Kericho to assist the British government in burning Kipsigis and Talai houses so that white settlers could uh, get land. And uh, it's very unfortunate 
that the British have not seen the need to address that kind of an ugly history. Uh, lastly, I wish to address uh, the issue pertaining to the Talai victims. Talai is a central clan within the Kipsigis community. We live in clans, and uh, inter-clan marriages is forbidden. This was known to the British, but they decided to take Talai people to remove them from Kericho, take them to a place called Kwasi, which I'm told actually that uh, the Kenya government has set it to be a, a national park. In other words, that's a place that is only habitable for wild animals. It is infested with a lot of mosquitoes and a cessa fly. The first three years of Talai occupation in 1934 uh, led to 100% miscarriage among the Talai women. In other words, they were not giving birth there successfully because of the conditions there. And what is interesting is that in 1925, there is a report that was presented to the British House of Commons that actually stated that Talai was not a good place. It was infested with Sese fly. Kwasi. Yeah, Kwasi, sorry. Kwasi was infested with Sese fly. And it beats logic why in 1934, nine years later, a responsible government will actually take people to a place which a commission had established was not fit for, uh, it's, it's called the Algo, Al, Algore report. We, we have uh, Gore report. We have that report as part of our materials. Um, I want to also say this, that Talai are not witches, the way the British government would want to say. They were removing them because they believed they were witch, witches. And even during their removal, it beats logics. And it's actually a very, they organized for a very bizarre kind of event, a ceremony, whereby 10 Kipsigis men, elderly men, were picked to take an oath. And they were made by the British District Commissioner, who was also the Kiricho District Magistrate, making these people to drink water from a human skull. Human skull. I mean, somebody who has died, but the British saw it fit to use those skulls, and they are the ones who actually killed those people anyway, to use human skull so that in other words, that, that kind of uh, an oath will actually bind those people who are doing that. And we are saying we are not going to let this go. We are saying and we are telling the British government in no uncertain terms that we believe that the land is ours. We believe that you have benefited a lot. I know the Kenya government has started a program of uh, investigating companies who are engaged in tax evasion, tax avoidance. But I must say, out of my research, that for a very long time, the British multinationals have been involved in what is called transfer pricing. Transfer price, uh, pricing, yes. Where they uh, s establish various companies outside Kenya, and then they sell the tea at a throwaway price because those are their companies, and that way, the Kenya government is not even able to raise enough tax. There is a company that for probably almost 20 years now, it has been declaring losses. We are aware of that. And we are saying that we are not going to remain seated and watch them benefit heavily on resources that actually should be benefiting everybody else. Um, I think I've said uh, enough. and. Uh, uh, probably I'll address other issues during a uh, question and answer. And maybe as a very last thing to say is that um, the British will always want to pass responsibility to the Kenya government. But we have to see this to say that after 1963, when we got independence on the 12th of December, the British government was responsible for Kenya. And that's why under the Independence Act, an act of parliament in the UK, that act says that UK will cease having responsibility over Kenya. So we are saying the British government was responsible up to the time we got independent. Secondly, we are able as legal scholars 
to distinguish between a protectorate and a colony. The land in Kiricho was not taken away during the colonial era. I want to be very clear with that. It was declared crown land during the protectorate era. A country that is exercising protectorate over a particular region only exercises what is called foreign jurisdiction, but not domestic jurisdiction. But for the British, they went ahead to exercise domestic jurisdiction. But then now during the colonial era, that is when they decided to take or to alienate land, which already was a crown land. And uh, we are very clear with that. And it's not the first time that people have uh, kind of made an attempt to address this issue. In 1932, there was the so-called the Kenya National, uh, the Kenya Land Commission, which was headed by uh, Lord Maurice Carter, which went collecting grievances from the African people, and they were in Kericho, and our uh, elders actually told that commission that the Kipsigis people were not happy because land had been taken away all from Londiani all the way to a place called, uh, um, I'm forgetting, a, a place in Kiricho uh, with tea from uh, the uh, Arab minor of uh, Belgut, actually complained that uh, land had been taken en masse. And they had actually suggested a form of arbitration telling them that now that they were able to link uh, them with England, a place they never knew, that go and tell the old men in England. They were actually asking for arbitration. When you look at it in retrospect, these elderly people never knew a lot. They were ignorant. They were not like the English men who had traveled all over the world. So they were saying, go and tell uh, the elders in England that we in Kipsis land are not happy because land has been taken away. And we are, um, but that felt on deaf ears. That is the time, and in a case, that commission of Lord Carter had recommended that uh, compensation be paid. We have not seen that compensation up to today. That report was submitted to the British cabinet in 1934. But I'm sure it, it's gathering dust. It's in the, anyway, it's in the archives. So we are saying that uh, we are discussing grievous matters. When you see a number of people who have found themselves to Maasai Mao, those are descendants of the victims. Others are direct victims who actually bought land from the Mao because they cannot buy land in Kericho, which is very expensive. Land in Kericho is very limited. Governor will tell you that because uh, you'll find people staying in 0 0.1 of an acre, and that is a whole family of maybe more than 12 people. So we are saying that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a matter which we are calling upon the United Nation, which is actually the family of nation, to actually find that British committed historical atrocities and that they owe apology to the victims, that is the Kipsis and the Talai. And we are also saying that reparation or compensation is quite apt. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done today in respect of uh, filing a, a complaint with the United Nations. We, we have today over the road uh, at the UN Human Rights Council, uh, which is in sitting at the moment, filed a, a formal complaint uh, on behalf of, of our clients, the Kericho County and, and over 100,000 victims from the Kipsigi and Talai communities uh, with the UN Human Rights Commissioner, uh, but also very specifically with the Special Rapporteur uh, on the promotion of truth, justice, reparation and guarantees of non-recurrence. That's a, a, a UN position that was established in 2011 precisely to look at, at these kinds of situations where national governments uh, have either refused to deal with the problem 
uh, or have reached a, a, a point where it is not solvable. Uh, the Special Rapporteur can step in with the backing of the United Nations uh, and under his or her mandate look to investigate the matter, uh, look to get the states concerned together to negotiate and reach a settlement uh, and make specific recommendations about how the situation can be resolved. Uh, the Special Rapporteur can also provide technical assistance and expertise uh, to allow that to happen uh, and very importantly can come to the country concerned and conduct a, a site visit to prepare their, their own report. That's what we're asking the Special Rapporteur to do in uh, our case because we've reached a stage where trying to negotiate with the UK government uh, has not produced any concrete results. Uh, that's not to say that it couldn't in the future, uh, but we have decided that it's in the best interests of our clients to, to elevate the matter now to the United Nations to get the Special Rapporteur and other UN officials involved so that there can be a resolution of this matter. You may recall that in uh, the UK in 2013, uh, there was a court case where a number of victims in relation to the Mau Mau uprising uh, sought to sue uh, the UK government for the torture and abuses that they had faced. Uh, and in that case, uh, after the UK had sought to throw out the case on the basis of time limitations, but also because they said it wasn't the responsibility of the UK government, uh, and those were rejected, the government then settled that case. Uh, paying nearly £20 million to a group of victims. The then Foreign Secretary William Haig saying he hoped that that would draw a line under the matter. But that was only one group. Uh, our clients are in a different area, a different group altogether, affected by the same pattern of colonial ab abuse and oppression, uh, but, but were never included uh, in that settlement. Uh, and there's no way, as a, as a matter of law, that, that you combine the entire group when they, when they weren't involved uh, in the first place. So we are saying that that process that was started and to be welcomed then by the British government should continue to all groups that have been equally affected. Uh, in fact, it's something the UN has said before, that the danger of some reparations to some victims is that in and of itself discriminates again. So not only have people suffered discrimination in the first place, but then in the way in which the remedy comes, you have the same form of discrimination later. So it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to be uniform. Uh, the UK courts have since that case uh, blocked a number of other cases you, you might have read on, on time limitations, uh, which many have argued is unreasonable uh, given that human rights have no time limitations. They, they didn't suddenly come into existence uh, you know, in, in the 20th or the late 20th century or, or, or recently. Uh, if they exist, which they certainly do, they've existed through, through all time uh, and apply equally. They, they are universal. So it, it, it can't be right that you have a cutoff point to when you can claim compensation. Certainly international crimes like genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes have no time limitation. You, you can prosecute for them at, at any stage and that has been recognized by, by the UN. So similarly reparations for human rights violations uh, we have submitted should, should not be cut off at any point. But having said that, we, we have decided that it would be a arduous road to try and proceed through the British courts with this case. Uh, there are a number of victims. It would take a huge amount of time, be very costly, and all kinds of legal obstacles can be thrown uh, in our way. Uh, litigation can become a, a, a messy business. Of course, we can always fall back on that if we have to, but our preferred route has been to look to arbitrate the matter and reach a settlement with, with the UK government. Uh, and this step is one going firmly in that direction, to take it to the United Nations for uh, an intervention. Uh, that being a much swifter way 
uh, and, and potentially a much more effective way of resolving the problem. So we have got together all of the evidence uh, from hundreds of, of victims, um, the documents from the National Archives. Uh, we've got uh, psychiatric reports and evidence as well to show how people continue to suffer today and to show the personal injury, the, the damage, for making out a case for reparations in, in respect of individuals as well as uh, groups. Uh, and, and that has all been put before the British government uh, and now before uh, the United Nations. The next step, so you, you know what could be expected, is that will all be examined, of course, by the Special Rapporteur and, and the UN here. Uh, and we will be looking to encourage the Special Rapporteur to visit Kenya, to see it firsthand, uh, to see the, the stark differences between walking around on the tea plantations and then going to where people live. Uh, there, there is nothing more evocative than being able to firsthand see exactly w what the colonial period has produced and how it continues uh, and, and has not been remedied. Uh, to interview the victims, to look to gather as much information uh, and ensure that all parties, including the multinationals there, the British government itself, is consulted on, on what can be done about this. And for the Special Rapporteur then to offer uh, their technical assistance and advice in how to deal with the situation. Uh, this is not something that is new. The, the Special Rapporteur has got involved in many situations previously uh, and situations going back. So there's no prohibition against retroactive application. The Special Rapporteur has been involved in inquiries regarding the Spanish Civil War, uh, regarding the Second World War, uh, regarding uh, the troubles in uh, Northern Ireland, um, events in Burundi, events in El Salvador. There have been a number of situations where the Special Rapporteur has got involved, conducted country visits and made findings and made recommendations for those states to be held to. So this is a, a precedent that can equally apply here one that readily is applicable, we say, and, and that's why we have sought to initiate this today. We will be now looking to engage with the UN to provide all necessary evidence and to get the process going as soon as possible. Of course, at any stage in this process, the UK government can sit down with us and look to resolve matters. So, so far, there's been a refusal even to meet, uh, which frankly we, we found astonishing on, on behalf of, of our clients that, that there hasn't even been a readiness to engage on the subject. Now there might well be a concern about what this opens up, but then that must happen. Uh, one can't sweep this under the carpet hoping that it'll go away and, and that people will forget. Because yes, there are only a few direct victims still alive. That's one of the reasons why they're bringing it now, because they, they, they want to try and get justice before they die. But it will pass on to their descendants, and the conditions in which people live don't go away. So it, it's not going to suddenly disappear. Far better, uh, we say, for the UK government to confront this now, uh, to deal with it in an open and transparent way. That's certainly the trend worldwide, to, to look at not closing the book on matters when they haven't been properly investigated. Far better for the future to deal with the past, to get the truth about what happened, uh, and, and then to look at building on that. And certainly, you, you might think for the UK government in its current predicament, looking at building partnerships around the world, that that is going to be hampered severely if it is unable to build trust uh, in places throughout the world, including in, in, in Kenya, where it has a colonial past. Uh, and to try and shift the responsibility to the, 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 the present government uh, is not going to work as, as a matter of law, but, but also logic. Uh, as has been explained, these parts were either under a protectorate or then a colony. They were clearly effectively controlled by the UK government. Uh, and even if 
they were controlled with others there. We have in criminal law, as you know, or in civil law, joint criminal enterprise, where you can be jointly responsible with persons. And at the very least, there was a common design that the British government was benefiting from and is therefore responsible for the violations that were committed. So there are a number of legal theories that apply to the situation, uh, together with the, the logic and morality of the circumstances as well. But as, but as a matter of law, there is a clear line of state responsibility for what has happened. We, we've set that out in the submission. And the last thing I want to highlight as well, which we've put into the complaint, which is very uh, important. Uh, often people say, well, you know, what, what, what is the law that was uh, applicable then? We, we, we know what it is now, but you know, what standards were we operating under then? And you know, we've made very clear that throughout that time, international human rights law was applicable. This was the time at which the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being adopted right here in Geneva in, in, in 1948. And it was always said at the time that these rights have always existed. So the Universal Declaration was in place. That, that was law at the time and going back. Likewise with, with, with Nuremberg, you'll remember the, the Allied powers all said at that time that, that we have always, as the world, uh, outlawed these kinds of atrocious acts. That's how they got jurisdiction to try the Axis powers. Uh, is they said that these crimes have always existed, uh, going back to the Hague Conventions in the early 1900s and even before that. So it, it would be disingenuous to say that somehow the law didn't exist then. Uh, the UK was also going into the European Convention of Human Rights at a later period while the colonial period was, was going on and, and made that convention applicable in Kenya as well. So there is an abundance of, of law which made it very clear that acts which involved alienating land from persons without any lawful basis and in the process uh, committing both war crimes and crimes against humanity were outlawed. So not, not, not only the taking over of the land, but also the way in which it was done, the crimes that were committed. We, we have outlined in our complaint a number of instances. Obviously, obviously we haven't been able to deal with them all, but of truly horrific killings, of rapes, rapes of young girls, of situations where parents were separated from their children and never seen again, houses burnt, complete destruction uh, and an inability to ever then return and, and then imprisonment and detention to, to stop people uh, moving around. Um, quite, quite harrowing accounts that, that people still alive today are able to give or give through their descendants. So that evidence is all before the UN. It will require further investigation. There'll be many more statements, but it certainly hits home how egregious the violations were and, and, and therefore the demand even now many years on for justice. I just want to end with um, what was mentioned, the, the Kenya National Land Commission uh, ha has made findings in respect of our case. We, we made submissions uh, before the commission in Caricho uh, and, and it made very clear recommendations which, which came out last year. Uh, I just wanted to highlight two or three to show what really the- This year. This year, yes, it came out this year. What, what, to show really what the UN should be following up on. Um, the Land Commission said that the British government should apologize for the various forms of injustices inflicted against the Kipsigis and Talai victims that led to, amongst others, loss of their ancestral land, that the Kenya government should make a, a, a formal acknowledgement that what was crown land was unlawfully taken from the Kipsigis and Talai by the colonial, that, that was taken by the colonial government, ought to have been surrendered to the community at independence, that the British government and the multinational tea companies are requested to construct for the Kipsigis and Talais 
amenities such as schools, hospitals, roads, museums, universities, and provide other services such as water and electricity that would alleviate or compensate their suffering, and that the British government should pay reparations to the direct victims of the historical land injustices. These were very clear recommendations that were made based on evidence and hearings. The report is is all available. We've given the report to the UN as well. Um, They are based on cogent findings in, in respect of the available evidence. And our plea is that they are now taken forward by the UN and ultimately the, the UK government to be implemented, not only in relation to land injustices, but the human rights violations as well. Thank you very much. Um. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to play a very short um, four-minute video, which is um, an interview with uh, one of the many people who uh, suffered greatly during um, the colonial period. Uh, And indeed, this gentleman, um, he talks about uh, how he was removed from the ancestral land uh, and taken to a region called Gwasi. So I'll just play the short four minute video um, and then uh, we'll have time for one or two questions after that. So thank you. Um, I don't know if we can dim the lights. Yeah. Tribe or clan. Tribe. I was born 1948 in a place called Gwasi. Uh, in Gwasi, my, my village is. Uh, my mom is called. My mother is called uh, Takigen Mbengi. Um, I was born in Gwasi, the way I've said, and uh, I went to school in Gwasi. But before I went to school, when I was born, uh, after two years, I was affected by polio due to bad sanitation. I was affected by polio due to bad sanitation, a lot of uh, supplies. Um, mosquitoes and snakes. Now, when I went to school, I went to Wasi with a lot of complications because of disability. And, uh, I never went in a proper way. Uh, I went uh, up to standard four by then. Um, in fact, when we were in Guasi, there was a lot of complications because of uh, the place is a bit hilly. A lot of animals, hyenas and, and all those things. Um, main, co- main problem is that I never went in a proper way. Uh, I went uh, up to standard four by then. Um, in fact, when we were in Guasi, there was a lot of complications because of uh, the place is a bit hilly. A lot of animals, hyenas and, and all those things. Um, main, co- main problem is that they were not allowed to come to Richo. There was a terrible issue which happened again because she never had any permit, so she was arrested and uh, she was judged escaping. So she was jailed for six months in Kisumu. And at the same time, I was still sick. So uh, I was taken by prison wardens and I was treated when my mom was in jail. So after coming from, uh, after mom coming from jail, because I was two years by then, we were taken back to Gwazi. My father had a problem, so also he was jailed for four years. So when he came, when he came out from jail, my mom and other wives, because my father had six women, 
uh, there was a lot of problem because my father was in jail again. So in fact, what happened is that in 19, after going to school, in 1960, we came to Kericho. We squatted here in Kericho, and that's the time I went to, I went to school a little bit. You didn't have any land? Oh. You had no land? No land. Where we were staying, it was belonging to Nyansa people. So what here in Kericho, there was no land. We were squatting here in Majengo, next to Majengo, where now it is called the Ibon area. So what would you want the British government to do? In fact, first of all, what I want British to do, legally, if you follow the legal, <coughs> when my father and his brothers were detained, there was a, a legal letter or certificate showing that these people have been detained. And it was signed by queen or governor, something of that sort. And uh, when we, we came from Wasi, there was no release certificate. So I consider myself, first of all, that I should be released. British government should give us certificate of release You're still in jail? You're still in jail. Up to this moment, I'm talking. Indirect jail men. And uh, it affects me because I know very well that I have not been released. What else would you want them to do for you? I want, uh, I'm requesting them, not really requesting, but the question is, there was no land, the land which you were in, living in Kiptere, we were stay, my father was staying, uh, belongs to other people now. Now we are requesting British government to compensate us. And you know, uh, at the end, um... Dixon says, uh, as we've very much been saying today, that uh, the lack of action is simply not good enough. And the, the smallest gesture, uh, even, you know, meeting with the victims would be greatly appreciated. Um, there was also a bit where it jumped in the middle uh, and uh, he's basically talking about his uh, mother's arrest, uh, which is the reason why they got sent to Gwasi uh, from uh, the ancestral land in Kiricho. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, if our speakers want to uh, come back, um, if you have uh, one or two questions, um, I... Uh, I have. I, I might start with a uh, question for the panel. Um, I think something uh, that is often asked is, uh, why are we doing this now and not um, however many years ago uh, when independence took place? Um, I know this is something we ourselves have discussed quite a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think uh, that would be my question. Why? Why now as opposed to 50 years ago. Okay. You answer the question straight away. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Nikita, for that question, that why are we doing it now? There are good reasons why uh, we are doing it now, and we are not going to use the political rhetoric that an idea whose time has come uh, or, or it has done cannot be resisted. You can resist uh, an invading army, but an idea not whose time has come. Um, why now? First and foremost, the kind of uh, independent constitution that we caught from the British, which was, which was coined at the Lancaster House, was what legal scholars call it adventitious constitution. A constitution which is not really a very good document, but one that gives not complete rights. It's almost like a, a negotiated settlement. It's only in the year 2010 that we caught what is called a homegrown constitution, that is autochthonous constitution, which was able to recognize and address historical injustices. The 1963 independent constitution in Kenya did not recognize historical injustices. But the one of, 19, of the year 2010 recognized historical injustices. It also provides for devolved units. It also provides in the devolved unit a system where uh, counties are able to identify 
the specific problems that affect, are affecting the people and therefore seek uh, a way forward in addressing them. And I think that is exactly what the Kiricho uh, government did. Having gotten the devolved uh, unit, the assembly of Kiricho was able to meet and able to appreciate that there was landlessness in Kiricho, there was a lot of poverty among various households, actually a vicious circle of poverty, and they could trace it to historical injustices. And that is why they were able to sit down and say, how do we address these things? You will appreciate that in Kenya, not all communities suffered land dispossession. The communities that suffered land dispossessions are the Kikuyus, not even all the Kalenjins, it's only the Nandi, the Kipsigis, the Tugens of uh, North, uh, Elda Maravine area, and of course you also have the Sabors, the, the, the Sebes and the, the Pokots, and also the Maasais. But we have in Kenya about 43 or 44 tribes, but not all of them suffered that. So probably it was very difficult for the entire uh, National Assembly to be able to pinpoint. So. I think I've uh, answered the question that the new constitutional dispensation provided an avenue for addressing this uh, uh, serious historical issue. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> that is a very important question. And I'm going to respond in this manner. In 2004, this same community attempted to petition the British government, which they successfully did by marching to the British Embassy in Nairobi and ultimately petitioning the British government. At the time, the British government thought that they would get away with it by saying that that was a matter for the Kenyan government. Because the old constitution protected them. The old Kenyan constitution had no leeway for addressing historical injustices. Then step number two that they took was to seek legal advice on how they would successfully petition the British government from solicitors globally and again uh, and again their challenges because of lack of capacity at that time they didn't have local lawyers who would help them but later on when the new constitution was promulgated it provided for an opportunity which included addressing historical injustices. But the beauty about the new constitution in Kenya is that it provides for two levels of government, county government and national government. This is the route which has helped the communities to address their issues. Because the constitution provides for petitioning a national or a sub-national government to listen to their issues. So in 2014, the Talai and the Kipsigis communities petitioned the county assembly of Kericho, and this is the route which then activated a search for legal counsel which would provide a roadmap for actualizing their desires to have their issues addressed. So we are here today courtesy of the new constitution. And since most victims are very poor, they could not afford legal fee, the county government of Kericho working together both as the legislative arm of the county assembly and the executive arm put up a budget to assist the victims get their issues sorted out through whatever route. And the route has already been highlighted by the Queen's Council. That it began with writing to the British government 
for a possibility of an out of court settlement which didn't work and these options are open but ultimately the route that we have taken is so that the united nations can get to know that these people have tried and that something needs to be done to them thank you uh yes we have a question at the back You um you can come forward a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Tony. Um, I work for the Commonwealth. I'm here in my personal capacity, just to make that clear. But I'm a Kenyan, so you can see the reason why I'm here. Um, uh, thank you very much for the exposition. I'm a Kenyan, but I've learned a lot. You would imagine that uh, being a Kenyan, I would already know all this, but I have learned a, a lot from. Uh, uh, Advocate uh, uh, Bosek, uh, uh, QC Dixon, and uh, Professor Chepkoni. So thank you for that. Now my question is whether you are taking a multi-pronged strategy to address this problem because from my reading of what you've just presented, it's clear that um, um, you have to pursue um, both an international strategy but also look at what is possible under the Kenyan constitution as you have just uh, said. Um, I have not heard you mention anything with Kenyan uh, courts. Um, Kenyan courts, are they part of the solution? Because in my thinking, the UN has a very limited, very limited ability to solve that problem. So the special rapporteur will go study the problem. He'll do a report at the Human Rights Council. But we all know that that will not bind anybody. It will not bind the British government. It will not bind the Kenyan government. It will not actually provide for compensation. Uh, the special rapporteur or the High Commission of Human Rights has no ability to order compensation for the victims. So the best they can do would be an advocacy role to highlight this issue to other states, to recognize that there is a problem. But where you can get uh, uh, reparations or compensation or, in fact, uh, ability to get even part of the land uh, given back to these landless people that you are mentioning clearly lies with either Kenyan courts or the British courts. So I would, uh, not to question your strategy, I would recommend that you really seriously consider also looking at how Kenyan courts can be involved because we all know that uh, under our new constitution, uh, making a petition to the courts and uh, arguing your case and uh, showing that your fundamental rights have been violated um, is a real possibility. And as you say, these are universal human rights. We cannot say, oh, they only um, apply if they happened after the constitution was promulgated. You can argue clearly that uh, these people were dispossessed of their land. It's uh, a, a situation that affects a lot of other Kenyans, the Maasais, the Samburus, the Sebeis, the Tavetas at the coast. So I think you'd also be contributing to the, uh, uh, to the liberation and uh, uh, f uh, solving of a, a very fundamental issue for other Kenyans as well, if you pursued such a strategy. Thank you very much. So, uh, 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 thank you very much. I was going to say both Bosek and. Uh, yeah, it's your yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Walter. No, not Walter. Uh, you said Anthony. Yeah. I almost called you Walter Sisuli. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, uh, we'll say that uh, this is a matter where you are taking the British government to, uh, to court. The matter of taking the British government to court must be in the English courts. And uh, QC. Rodney has explained the hurdles that we have had in taking the British government to their own court. You will uh, recall that the Mau Mau II actually uh, could not take off because of the issue of limitation. And it appears that from the High Court, uh, Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court of England and Wales, that was the issue, that there is limitation. But remember the Mau Mau II was about uh, personal injuries and torture. This one includes also the aspect of land. And when it comes to the aspect of land, we have gone to the National Land Commission, as uh, Rodney Dixon QC uh, stated, and uh, actually there is a recommendation. First and foremost, the National Land Commission is very much alive to the fact that uh, what we are being told is the total acreage of land is actually misleading. So the county government was given the task or the responsibility to resurvey the land, 
we know that this land could be probably two and a half times what the multinationals are stating. There is also concealment of facts. And even before we took the surveyors to survey the land, the multinational, a number of multinational companies went to court to block us. And there's an ongoing uh, case in Nairobi where uh, the, some multinationals have sued the Kericho, Bomet County government plus the National Land Commission saying that uh, whatever was decided by the commission, the recommendation was not, uh, is not something that should be adopted. But we are tussling it out and uh, we are hoping that uh, we'll be able to have the entire application dismissed because uh, as lawyers, we know where to hit hard. And I can assure you that uh, the, on the issue of land, I am 90% very optimistic that when the survey is done, what the National Land Commission said is that whatever acreages that are over and above, that one should go to the community through the uh, county government as trustees directly. That's number one. Number two, um, the multinationals be allowed a lease of uh, probably up to 90 years, sorry, from uh, this year to remain as tenants, but no tenants of the national government of Kenya, but tenants of the county uh, governments. And as tenants, they are obliged to pay rent at a commercial rate not to use the 1915 rates that they have been using so far, 1915 before we even became a colony, not to use figures that are uh, very, uh, I mean, ridiculous. They were also told that they have to pay rates at the commercial rate. For a very long time, they were playing around with figures, like uh, two and a half acres, which is actually like one hectare, uh, the multinationals will luckily say that uh, the value of that land will be like uh, 800 million, 800,000. But today we know very well, and the governor will confirm this, that the land they are sitting on, when, they were, when it was being compulsory acquired, 10 acres was being acquired for a water project. That is when they came up with the valuation that one acre is 10 million. So um, I think governor will answer that as to what steps, because the National Land Commission recommendation is that steps must be taken and must be taken within three years. So that's something that we are going to actualize. On the issue of land, uh, that one we are going to, we'll fight tooth and nail to ensure that uh, we actualize it, because it is for the good of the people. But there are these th things of what is called in law a uh, mean profit. Normally it is spelled Mesne, as though it is Mesne profit, but it's mean profit, which the National Land Commission is also saying the British government and the multinationals ought to pay the local people. That is what we are pursuing. We are also pursuing issues to do with torture. We are pursuing issues to do with cruel and uh, degrading treatment. And we are saying all those things, we cannot address just one aspect, and that is the land aspect, which, as I said, the Kenyan courts are involved in it. And let me say this that we were very much happy when the Attorney General also joined us to say actually the court, the multinationals had filed that case does not have jurisdiction because in Kenya we have the Environment and Land Court. But they went to the ordinary courts. And that is the strategy they were doing even during colonial times. Instead of the Kiricho uh, station, High Court station, has both Environment and Land Court and also the ordinary courts. But when you read in the materials in the archives, the multinational team companies and their lawyers have always been saying that let not file anything in Kericho because it will attract local attention. That has been their strategy. But today we are telling them that it's no longer a local matter. It has become a global matter. So thank you very much, uh, Walter. We are adopting, not Walter. I don't know why I'm baptizing you. It's, 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 uh, Sisuli. You say it's Sisuli, isn't it? Sisule. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, let me say this, we are adopting a multi-pronged approach in this. Bri briefly, I mean, and in short, we, we, we have to pursue every single 
avenue here. Uh, but you don't want to go down rabbit holes that are, are going to get you absolutely nowhere. Uh, the problem with the UK courts at the moment is, is, is on the limitation issue. Um, now, that may be challengeable, uh, maybe in certain cases. It might mean that you can't do every case. You have to select some. Uh, and, and we therefore have that as a, as a backup, that, that, that we could go after certain cases uh, where we'd have the best chance of succeeding. But in order to meet the expectations of the entire client group, very hard to do that through the UK court because of the limitations that have been uh, imposed. Uh, and there might be very particular reasons why they're, they're, they have been imposed, but difficult to challenge purely in court. That's why one has to look broader than that uh, and take it to the international level, because this is one of the first times that a matter like this is coming to this, the Special Rapporteur, and we think that could have positive ramifications. And, ha and having it opened up at, at that level could provide the catalyst for uh, a resolution, together with doing many other things as well. Uh, I think the Kenyan court certainly can be looked at because the recommendations have to be implemented. If they're not, then legal action could be taken there. The other forums as well, there's the European Court uh, on Human Rights, uh, which, which might have a jurisdictional reach uh, in this situation. So all of those are, 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 are there, and it, it is vital to pursue every one in the hope, of course, that the matter can be settled before then, because it will be protracted, it will be difficult. The victims want it addressed now. Many of them are very old as well, and that's what we're trying to, through this process, encourage the parties to do, uh, to show the, the real value of, of not fighting it out endlessly in court, which will just be a you know, protracted dogfight. You know, ra rather look at being proactive and constructive and sorted out for longer-term benefits for, for all parties. Uh, maybe just to add to what the councils have said, the recommendations of the National Land Commission are to be acted upon by the governments of Bomet, county governments of Bomet and Kiricho. And these are the two counties where you have the Kipsigis and the Talai. And all the ten recommendations must be implemented within three years. I would like to say that uh, as the two governments, we are already beginning the implementation process and we will implement them in total. For example, shortly, we will be informing Unilever, Finlay's and Williamson that uh, we want to reserve the land and any excess land which they've been owning over time has to be returned to the county governments of uh, Kericho and Bomet to be held in trust for the people. Second, we are already working on a valuation role in which now land levies will be at commercial rates. Number three, we are also in the process of ensuring that um, the recommendation especially on this excess land is not just on excess land but on total acreage which actually should be due. Apparently it does seem like they only declared land under T. And land where there are houses, uh, fuel trees like blue gum and riparian areas are not declared. So this total land area we are going to reserve and disclose it to public. And any land that they've been owning over and above what they should, they have to pay at commercial price, at commercial rates. Then the other thing is they need to return the title deeds to the county government so that now they can be given new title deeds reading county government of Pomet and Kericho in which new leases now will be prepared for them because the old leases were under the crown. So these are some of the issues that we are going to implement immediately and that is why we are very serious. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to have to stop it there because we've got to get a flight to London. Um, but uh, there's food, uh, so please help yourselves. Um, and I'm sure if you have any other burning questions, uh, we will be around uh, to answer those for the next half hour or so. So thank you very much for coming today. And thank you to, the, to our speakers and to the um, Geneva Press Club for hosting us here today. Thank you.